This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Section 22 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Bergman. Chapter 15 The Urge of Sex. Sunday night, my new cell on the upper gallery is hot and stuffy. I cannot sleep. Through the bars, I gaze upon the Ohio. The full moon hangs above the river, bathing the waters in mellow light. The strains of a sweet lullaby wander through the woods, and the banks are merry with laughter. A girlish cadence rings like a silvery bell, and voices call in the distance. Life is joyous and near, terribly, tantalizingly near. But all is silent and dead around me. For days the feminine voice keeps ringing in my ears. It sounded so youthful and buoyant, so fondly alluring. A beautiful girl, no doubt. What joy to feast my eye on her. I have not beheld a woman for many months. I long to hear the soft accents, feel the tender touch. My mind persistently reverts to the voice on the river, the sweet strain in the woods, and fancy wreaths, sad-toned fugues upon the merry carol, paints vision and image as I pace the floor in agitation. They live, they breathe, I see the slender figure with the swelling bosom, the delicate white throat, the babyish face with large, wistful eyes, why, it is Luba. My blood tingles violently, passionately, as I live over again, the rapturous wonder at the first touch of her maiden breast. How temptingly innocent sounded the immodest invitation on the velvety lips, how exquisite the suddenness of it all. We were in New Haven then, one by one we had gathered till the little New York commune was complete. The girl joined me first, for I felt lonely in the strange city, drudging as a compositor on a country weekly, the evenings cold and cheerless in the midst of a conservative household. But the girl brought light and sunshine, and then came the twin and mania. Luba remained in New York, but Mania, devoted little soul, yearned for her sister, and presently the three girls worked side by side in the corset factory. All seemed happy in the free atmosphere, and Luba was blooming into beautiful womanhood. There was a vague something about her that now and then roused in me a fond longing, a rapturous desire. Once, it was in New York, a year before, I had experienced a sudden impulse toward her. It seized me unheralded, unaccountably. I had called to try a game of chess with her father when he informed me that Luba had been ill. She was recovering now and would be pleased to see me. I sat at the bedside, conversing in low tones, when I noticed the pillows slipping from under the girl's head. Bending over, I involuntarily touched her hair, loosely hanging down the side. The soft, dark chestnut thrilled me, and the next instant I stooped and stealthily pressed the silken waves to my lips. The momentary sense of shame was lost in the feeling of reverence for the girl, with a beautiful hair that bewildered and fascinated me, and a deep yearning suddenly possessed me as she lay in exquisite disarray, full of grace and beauty. And all the while we talked, 
my eyes feasted on her ravishing form, and I felt envious of her future lover, and hated the desecration. But when I left her bedside, all traces of desire disappeared, and the inspiration of the moment faded like a vision affrighted by the dawn. Only a transient, vague inquietude remained, as of something unattainable. Then came that unforgettable moment of undreamed bliss. We had just returned from the performance of Tosca, with Sarah Bernhardt in her inimitable role. I had to pass through Luba's room on my way to the attic, in the little house occupied by the commune. She had already retired, but was still awake. I sat down on the edge of the bed, and we talked of the play. She glowed with inspiration of the great tragedian. Then, somehow, she alluded to the decollete of the actresses. I don't mind a fine bust exposed on the stage, I remarked. But I had a powerful opera glass. Their breasts looked fleshy and flabby. It was disgusting. Do you think mine nice? she asked suddenly. For a second I was bewildered. But the question sounded so enchantingly unpremeditated, so innocently eager. I never... Let me see them, I said impulsively. No, no, she cried in aroused modesty. I can't, I can't. I won't look, Luba. See, I close my eyes. Just a touch. Oh, I can't. I'm ashamed. Only over the blanket, please, Sasha. She pleaded as my hand softly stole under the covers. She gripped the sheet tightly, and my arm rested on her side. The touch of the firm, round breast thrilled me with passionate ecstasy. In fear of arousing her maidenly resistance, I strove to hide my exultation, while cautiously and tenderly I released the coverlet. They are very beautiful, Luba, I said, controlling the tremor of my voice. You like them? Really, Sasha? The large eyes looked lustrous and happy. They are Greek, dear, and snatching the last covering aside, I kissed her between the breasts. I'm so glad I came here, she spoke dreamily. Were you very lonesome in New York? It was terrible, Sasha. You like the change? Oh, you silly boy, don't you know? What, Luba? I wanted you, dear. Her arms twined softly about me. I felt appalled. The girl, my revolutionary plans, flitted through my mind, chilling me with self-reproach. The pale hue of the attained cast its shadow across the spell, and I lay cold and quiet on Luba's breast. The coverlet was slipping down, and reaching for it, my hand inadvertently touched her knee. Sasha, how can you? She cried in alarm, sitting up with terrified eyes. I didn't mean to, Luba. How could you think that of me? I was deeply mortified. My hand relaxed on her breast. We lay in silent embarrassment. It is getting late, Sasha. She tenderly drew my head to her bosom. A little while yet, dear. And again the enchantment of the virgin breasts was upon me, and I showered wild kisses on them and pressed them passionately, madly, till she cried out in pain. You must go now, dear. Good night, Luba. Good night, dearest. You haven't kissed me, Sashenka. I felt her detaining lips as I left. In the wakeful hours of the night, the urge of sex grows more and more insistent. Scenes from the past live in my thoughts. The cell is peopled with familiar faces. Episodes long dead to memory rise animated before me. They emerge from the darkest chambers of my soul, 
and move with intense reality, like the portraits of my sires come to life in the dark, fearful nights of my childhood. Pert Masha smiles at me from her window across the street, and a bevy of girls pass me demurely with a modestly averted gaze, and then call back saucily in thinly disguised voices. Again I am with my playmates, trailing the schoolgirls on their way to the river, and we chuckle gleefully at their affright and confusion as they discover the eyes glued to the peepholes we had cut in the booth. Inwardly I resent Nadia's bathing in her shirt, and in a revenge dive beneath the boards, rising to the surface in the midst of the girls, who run to cover in shame and terror. But I grow indignant at Vanka, who badgers the girls with Tsiba Tsiba Ba, and I soundly thrash Kolia for shouting nasty epithets across the schoolyard at little Nunia, whom I secretly adore. But the note of the later days return again and again, and the scenes of youth recede into their dim frames. Clearer and more frequently appear Sonia and Luba, and the little sweetheart of my first months in America. What a goose she was! She would not embrace me, because it's a great sin, unless one is married. But how slyly she managed to arrange kissing games at the Sunday gatherings at her home, and always lose to me. She must be quite a woman now, with a husband, children. Quickly she flits by, the recollection even of her name lost in the glow of anarchist emotionalism and the fervent enthusiasm of my orchard street days. There flames the light that irradiates the vague longings of my Russian youth and gives rapt interpretation to obscurely pulsating idealism. It sheds the hollow of illuminating justification upon my blindly rebellious spirit and visualizes my dreams on the sunlit mountains. The sordid misery of my greenhorn days assumes a new aspect. Ah, the wretchedness of those first years in America. And still, time's woof and warp unroll the tapestry of life in the new world, its joys and heart throbs. I stand a lone stranger, bewildered by the flurry of Castle Garden, yet strong with hope and courage to carve my fate in freedom. The Tsar is far away, and the fear of his hating Cossacks is past. How inspiring is liberty! The very air breathes enthusiasm and strength, and with confident ardor I embrace the new life. I join the ranks of the world's producers, and glory in the full manhood conferred by the dignity of labor. I resent the derision of my adopted country on the part of my family abroad, resent it hotly. I feel wronged by the charge of having disgraced my parents' respected name by turning a low, dirty working man. I combat their snobbishness vehemently and revenge the indignity to labor by challenging comparison between the old and the new world. Behold the glory of liberty and prosperity, the handiwork of a nation that honors labor. The loom of time keeps weaving. Lone and friendless, I struggle in the new land. Life in the tenements is sordid, the fate of the worker dreary. There is no dignity of labor. Sweatshop bread is bitter. Oppression guards the golden promise, and servile brutality is the only earnest of success. Then, like a clarion note in the desert, sounds the call of the ideal. 
strong and rousing, rolls the battle cry of revolution. Like a flash in the night, it illumines my groping. My life becomes full of new meaning and interest, translated into the struggle of a world's emancipation. Fedia joins me, and together we are absorbed in the music of the new humanity. It is all far, far, yet every detail is sharply etched upon my memory. Swiftly pass before me the years of complete consecration to the movement, the self-imposed poverty and sacrifices, the feverish tide of agitation in the wake of the Chicago martyrdom, the evenings of spirited debate, the nights of diligent study, and over all looms the Fridays. In the little dingy hall in the ghetto, where the handful of Russian refugees gather, where bold imprecations are thundered against the tyranny and injustice of the existing and winged words prophecy, the near approach of a glorious dawn. Beshawled women and men, long-coated and piously bearded, steal into the hall after synagogue prayers and listen with wandering eyes, vainly striving to grasp the strange Jewish so perplexedly interspersed with the alien words of the new evangel. How our hearts rejoice as, with exaggerated deference, we eagerly encourage the diffident questioner. Do you really mean, may the good Lord forgive me, there is no one in heaven above? Late in the evening the meeting resolves into small groups, heatedly contending over the speaker's utterances, the select circle finally adjourning to the corner. The obscure little tea-room resounds with the joust of learning and wit. Fascinating is the feast of reason, impassioned the flow of soul, as the passage at arms grows more heated with the advance of the night. The alert-eyed host diplomatically pacifies the belligerent factions. Gentlemen, gentlemen, shh! The police station is just across the street. There is a lull in the combat. The angry opponents frown at each other. And in the interim, the Austrian student, in his mellow voice, begins an interminable story of personal reminiscence, apropos of nothing and starting nowhere, but intensely absorbing. With sparkling eyes, he holds us spellbound, relating the wonderful journey, taking us through the Nevsky in St. Petersburg, thence to the Caucasus, to engage in the blood feuds of the Cherkessi, or enmeshed in a perilous flirtation with an Albanian beauty in a Muslim harem, he descants on the philosophy of Mohammed, imperceptibly shifting the scene to the Nile to hunt the hippopotamus, and suddenly interrupting the amazing adventures by introducing an acquaintance of the evening. My excellent friend, the coming great Italian virtuoso from Odessa, gentlemen. He will entertain us with an area from Trovatore. But the circle is not in a musical mood. Someone challenges the student's familiarity with the Muslim philosophy, and the twin hints at the gossiped intimacy of the Austrian with Christian missionaries. There are protestations and loud clamor for an explanation. The student smilingly assents, and presently he is launched upon the Chinese sea in the midst of a strange caravan trading tea at Yakta and aiding a political to escape to Vladivostok. The night pales before the waking sun, the twin yawns, and I am drowsy with. Coffee! Want coffee? Hey, get up there! Didn't you hear the bell? End of section 22「This Has Been a Librivox Recording」。It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist.